to survive in the harsh lands of America, of North America. So I wanted to um, read a little, just a little section of it that I thought is so beautiful, and I think it's very appropriate because President Obama has just been elected, and he's been mentioning this, this, this speech, actually. He's talked about this speech, and it's called City Upon a Hill, and it's the hope that he has that America will be a city upon a hill um, that we can all look up to and have as a guide. And he says, for this end, we must be knit together in this work as one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluities for the supply of others' necessities. We must uphold a familiar commerce together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. We must delight in each other, make others' conditions our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work as members of the same body. So shall we keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The Lord will be our God and delight to dwell among us as his own people and will command a blessing upon us in all our ways, so that we shall see much more of his wisdom, power, goodness, truth, than formerly we have been acquainted with. We shall find that God of Israel is among us, when ten of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies. So that was the little passage that I highlighted, and I stopped there because it goes on and on. But I really, I encourage everybody to go look. Wait a second, Obama used to use some, he, he said, he so basically some, he, he, yes, Obama, um, takes this idea and it's weave, it's woven into a lot of his speeches. Again, this idea of, and he says it in his speeches when he says things like, be your brother's and your sister's keeper, but this idea that we take care of each other and that we're a community, you know, during the times of prosperity and during the times of grief that we're together. Um, and then this other one, I'm also just going to read a tiny little section, but this was written by a, a poet, his name is Carl Dennis, and it's a political poem. It's about Iraq, and I thought that it would also be appropriate just because so many families are not together right now. Um, and this is not just for soldiers, but for all families who aren't together, that somewhere someone is missing. Um, and the idea, it's a narrative poem, which means that it's told in a very story-like way, and I, I think it's very accessible. So I'm just going to read a little section as well. And he says, I guess I have to begin by admitting I'm thankful today I don't live in a country my country has chosen to liberate. That Bridgeport's my home, not Baghdad. Mm. Thankful my chances are good when I leave for the stop and shop that I'll be returning. And I'm thankful my TV set is still broken. No point in wasting energy feeling shame for the havoc inflicted on others in my name when I need all the strength I can muster to teach my eighth grade class in the low rent district. There at least I don't feel powerless. There my choices make some difference. This month, I'd like to believe I've widened my students' choice of vocation through the odds my history lessons on working the land will inspire in any of them to farm. Are almost as small as the odds one will become a monk or nun trained in the Buddhist practice we studied last month in the unit on India. Mm. The point is to get them suspecting the world they know firsthand isn't the only world. As for the calling of soldier, if it comes up in class, it's not because I feel obliged to include it, as you, a writer, may feel obliged. A student may happen to introduce it, as a girl did yesterday when she read her essay about her older brother, Ramon, listed as missing in action three years ago, and about her dad who won't agree with her mom, and the social worker on how small the odds are that Ramon is still alive, a prisoner in the mountains. I didn't allow the discussion that followed, more time than I allowed for the other essays, and I wouldn't take sides, not with the group, that thought the father, having grieved enough, ought to move on to the life still left him, not with the group that was glad he didn't make do, with the next to nothing the world's provided, that instead he's invested his trust in a story that saves the world from shameful failure. Let me know of any recent attempts on your part to save our fellow citizens from themselves. In the meantime, if you want to borrow Ramon for a narrative of your own, remember that any scene where he appears under guard in a mountain village should be confined to the realm of longing. There his captors may leave him when they move on. There his wounds may be healed. 
his health restored, a total recovery, except for a lingering fog of forgetfulness, a father dreams he can burn away.